For 20 years, this region was at the mercy of the Lord's Resistance Army, a rebel group infamous for rape, murder, and the abduction of child soldiers. From their homes, refugees sought sanctuary in temporary camps, sparking a humanitarian crisis. Today, the rebels are gone, but as life returns to normal, a new war has begun. The enemy this time, malaria. I've seen about one kid a week die since I've been here. Again, this is um, high season, malaria season, um, rainy season. Right after it rains, after the incubation period, seven to 14 days, the hospital's full of kids with malaria. So I came in right at the, the busy time. Okay. In theory, malaria is easily treated with drugs known as ACTs. But ACTs are valuable, and in Uganda, as in other parts of Africa, there is a growing black market trade in the medications. Left unchecked, that trade threatens our best and currently last defense against the disease. There is a racket. They are responsible for the death of a lot of children and mothers in this country. These are the invisible victims of malaria. Every day, the disease kills 340 people in Uganda, the majority of them women and children under five. That's nearly 120,000 deaths a year from a disease that is entirely preventable. Malaria is transmitted by the female Anopheles mosquito. Hatching in stagnant water, the mosquito spreads its poison at night when it emerges to take a blood meal. With each bite, the mosquito injects hundreds of tiny parasites into the bloodstream of its victims. The symptoms are unforgettable. The parasites devour the red blood cells, sparking fevers, chills, and agonizing headaches. In the worst cases, malaria can also result in anemia, coma, and death. In theory, all it takes to prevent mosquitoes transmitting the disease are bed nets treated with insecticides. And all it takes to interrupt the life cycle of the malaria parasite is a course of treatment with these pills. The pills contain a miraculous compound known as artemisinin, derived from a plant cultivated in China. The Chinese name for the herb is Qing Hao, but in English, it is better known as Artemisia annua. If administered correctly, artemisinin is a complete cure for the disease. These drugs are more rapidly effective than any other antimalarial drug, which means you get better more quickly. And they're very, very reliable, and they're very well tolerated. In fact, they're remarkable. This molecule effectively acts like a warhead when it's delivered into the, into the bloodstream of a patient who's suffering from malaria. And essentially what happens then is that a byproduct that's produced by the parasite activates the warhead and then the warhead kills the parasite. In countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda and Zambia, ACTs donated by UK and US taxpayers are now leading to dramatic falls in the incidence of malaria. But Uganda has not been so fortunate. Here, ACTs provided by Western donors are still not reaching people in need. In theory, ACTs are supposed to be available free of charge at government hospitals and clinics. But Uganda's public health system is in disarray. Worse, officials are now rumored to be selling the drugs on the black market, inflating the cost and leading to unlicensed prescribing. As a result, many people are being given the wrong treatment. This is Joyce. She works for a Ugandan aid agency, teaching refugees how to sterilize water from the local well. We are going to mess. I can't find it again. 
Her work protects people from other diseases. But in Mariupay, children are still dying from malaria. Their bodies, marked by makeshift graves, scattered throughout the village. Even Joyce's own son, Innocent, could not escape the threat. When Innocent fell ill, Joyce's first impulse was to seek help from a local pharmacist. He guessed the boy had malaria, but as Joyce only had 500 Ugandan shillings, about 15 pence, she could not afford an ACT. Instead, the pharmacist prescribed an old line malaria drug. Within minutes of taking the pills, she says Innocent vomited, and instead of getting better, his fever got worse. So innocent. Fortunately, Joyce lives a short walk from the Médecins Sans Frontières clinic at Mario Pei, one of the few places in the region where ACTs are free. Here, doctors have the equipment to assess patients properly and prescribe the correct drugs. This is a uh, one-year, one-month-old who was given some anti-malarial medicine out in the village and some paracetamol. Kid was vomiting, didn't quite take all the medicine, came in here. The impression was severe malaria with vomiting, and we treated the child with IV quinine drip. This morning, we switched to Coartem. Okay, so this is Sunday, right? Dr. Eamon Vitt Sunday, left a lucrative now? practice in New York to work okay. for MSF, arriving in Mario Pay in June, the height of the rainy season. Okay, you my tech? Okay. Every week, Eamon sees between 40 to 50 children infected with malaria. By the time they reach the ward, many are severely anemic. Others have cerebral malaria and have to be given intravenous drugs. On the ward at the moment, uh, nine malaria cases and eight are children five years old. That's really potentially fatal in kids. And my first day here, walking to the hospital, a mother ran clear across the field and handed me her one-year-old, who is essentially in a coma, had yellow eyes, and a high fever. That doesn't really happen every day in Manhattan. Malaria is a potentially preventable and treatable disease, so it seems quite ridiculous that all these sick kids are populating the hospital. These kids here are just not getting the medications at the correct dosage or the correct amount at the right time. The drug shortages in Kitgum are a big talking point in the Ugandan capital. This is Kojo Edo, the head of the MSF mission to Uganda. Kojo has long campaigned for better access to ACTs. In 2003, when the malaria epidemic erupted in Burundi and the treatment regime failed, Kojo gave people ACTs instead. His action helped avert a humanitarian disaster. Now Kojo is traveling to Kitkan to investigate the rumors that ACTs purchased by the government are going missing. This is the malaria season. This is the time we need this, the artemisinin-based combination to be available to treat people. But I know that the supply of these drugs is erratic and is not available in the health facilities. So I want to find out what is the problem, why this drug is not delivered to people. Kojo's first stop is Namakora, near the border with Sudan. Apparently, the health center there has suffered repeated delivery problems and is now completely out of Coatum, the best known ACT purchased by the government. Our ultimate goal is to make sure that these drugs are, are available in all the health centers uh, to, for people to access it. So this is our dispensary. These are the only drugs that we still have uh, at the quantities left in the store. Uh, we don't have quite them completely. Uh, what we are using is now uh, Fancida. Fanzadar, also known as Oradar, is an old line medication that is now useless against many strains of the parasite. So, this is uh, 
for main store, we don't have quinine. So we don't have quinine, we don't, we don't have, have uh, 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 artemisinin-based uh, combination. Not there completely. The storeroom is empty, despite the fact that Matthew places an order in advance every quarter. The government coatum is supposed to come every four weeks, but there hasn't been a delivery for two months. So you have not received any response to your July request yet? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not what? yet. This July request, we expect the supplies to come around September. And what about June? Uh, currently, <clears throat> I, have, I was told there's already some drugs which they, they brought in, in the medical store. So uh, because of transport uh, problem, I think it has delayed. It is over, over a week now since it has been there. It is not yet distributed to the peripheral units. Okay. At but this uh, we hope to receive it any time. This has been a common problem. Usually drugs delay there. So all the malaria cases, we are treating them using uh, Fancida. We have Fancida. The, it is only out of frustration that we are moving backward. Matthew's information confirms Kojo's worst fears. Now the civil war is over, Médecins Sans Frontières should be able to leave Kitkum. But if MSF withdraws, Kojo has no confidence that the government will supply the ACTs people so desperately need during the rainy season. What we, we just saw in that health centre is a, a, a functional peripheral health staff doing his job and then probably his blockage is at district or at national level. If you talk to the district, they say we send the order. At Kampala level, you hear the story that drugs are available. We are not receiving orders from the district. And if you go to the farthest uh, periphery possible, that's what you have been to there, you, you see physically that there's no quarter. It's like a ping pong game going on here. And uh, what is at stake, we have to remember, is the lives of under, under five children and pregnant women. Despite what Matthew's been told, Kojo suspects that drugs may not be in the district storeroom. He's heard rumours that the public hospital in Kitkum is also out of Coatum. He'd like to speak to the district health officer, but despite repeated calls, his requests for an interview are denied. It is going beyond frustration. It's shocking. It is something that needed to be solved immediately. If delivered promptly and in the correct formulation, ACTs save lives. But all too often, the medications don't reach women and children in time, resulting in dangerous complications. You can see. He's still stiff. You see? You can see. This is stiff. So this child we need to right now again put on more more treatment. You can see the hands normally rigid because of cerebral involvement. This actually now how you get this problem. There's already cerebral involvement due to the malaria and we need to be handled vigorously. Mm. Uh, this child can recover, but uh, my concern is the child could end up with some residual of brain damage where maybe the hands could be stiff or the legs and will have a, a distorted gait when they are walking. But we need a, a vigorous treatment right now. Kitkum General should be the first port of call for emergency cases, as treatment there is free. But because the drug supplies are erratic, many patients prefer to go to St. Joseph's, the local Catholic missionary hospital. Overall, we have now 633 patients, but 439 are children. Look at the magnitude. And these children are mainly malaria, 80% are actually cases of malaria. Dealing with emergency cases is not the only challenge. Dr. Ojum shows us a letter he's just received from the superintendent of Kitkum General Hospital. He's run out of blood transfusion bags and asks if St. Joseph's can lend him some from its own stores. But for Dr. Ojum, it is a struggle just to keep up with the influx of new patients many of whom arrive at St. Joseph's in a critical condition. Last night, actually, we had uh, three children referred. Uh, one died because of real anemia. Uh, by the time it reached, it was completely paper white. Uh, we could not get a line to put blood and died before we could do anything. 
The second one came actually with convulsions from, I would say, a distance of about 25 kilometers away. That one also came, we started treatment, but could not really catch up. And the other one had pneumonia with malaria, and really the chest was so bad, we nebulized, we put on antibiotics, we put on oxygen, also died. This is what happened last night. And this is a common trend. Those who come from far tend to die before we do a good work. Many of the casualties are buried in the grounds of the hospital. Children are not the only victims. Dr. Ojum is checking on a recent arrival. Ketty Ulmer was expecting a baby and was near full term when she contracted malaria. She was rushed to St. Joseph's by ambulance from a clinic 40 kilometers away. Uh, okay, so she got a wrong instruction from there. She was, we was given Coatem to take two in the morning, two in the evening, which is really a dose for children. This is a common thing we notice. Some of these health centers are manned by unqualified staff, really. Sometimes prescribed and given less because they want the other one for some other purpose. This one would have died immediately. Actually, this is a very severe complication. If you have intrauterine fetal death with severe anemia and there's no blood transfusion, this would be really a maternal death now. Unfortunately, her baby was not so lucky. Malaria alone by the fever causes a contraction of the uterus. The baby is really expelled. She was about to have a delivery, and now this is what happened. The system is in a disarray, and there is no serious commitment to see it change. And that's why you see the missionary facilities a bit overwhelmed. Often, the difference between life and death is as simple as providing good quality care at local level. Unfortunately, most drug shops don't have the facilities to carry out proper tests. In Mariope, however, Médecins Sans Frontières has clear procedures for diagnosing malaria. The first stop is the paracheck tent for a blood test. There, a simple pinprick is all it takes to confirm whether a child is infected. <laughs> if the test is positive, Patients are given a three-day course of oral ACTs from MSF's own stores. The coartum comes in separate pediatric and adult formulations. The packs are clearly labeled so that the patient knows precisely how many pills they need to take every day and for how long. If they weigh five to 15 kilograms, they take this pack, one pill in the morning, one at night. Okay, they're 15 to 25 kilograms. They take two in the morning, two at night, and so on and so forth. You or I, we take four pills in the morning, four pills at night for a total of three days. We're all familiar with these issues when the doctor tells you to, you know, take 10 days of penicillin and you take it for a day and you feel better and then you forget. And this is a, a common thing in developed countries too. Um, but with something like malaria, it's even more important that you take the full course. If you don't, you're having a, a suboptimal level of the drug in your system and you might start creating resistant organisms. And that's, that's the biggest fear is that these artemisinin and artemether derived combinations, if they're misused and resistance develops, it's a big problem. Not just for Uganda. For the whole world. This is Pai Lin in Western Cambodia. A former Khmer Rouge stronghold, Pai Lin is in the midst of a construction boom. But building roads is not the only challenge facing the authorities. It was here that in the 1960s, resistance first emerged to chloroquine, then the standard treatment for malaria. Within a few years, migrant workers had spread resistance to other parts of Asia. 
In the 1980s, the same thing happened to sulfadoxin pyrimethamine. Then, in the late 1990s, resistance spread to Africa, prompting the World Health Organization to call for governments to switch to ACTs. Now, scientists fear history could be repeating itself. It usually takes just 48 hours for artemisinin to clear the bloodstream of parasites. But some Cambodian patients now require higher doses and are taking almost twice as long to recover. If artemisinin follows the same pattern as chloroquine and fanzadar, then within 30 years that resistance could spread worldwide. Professor Nick White first read about artemisinin in the 1980s. He's now a leading campaigner for ACTs. If artemisinin resistance spreads to Africa, then we will have a replay of what happened with chloroquine resistance. Rising mortality and morbidity, more children dying, more sick children, more anemic children, more children who can't go to school, more low birth weight babies. It's a it will be a humanitarian disaster, and it's avoidable. The causes of resistance are complex, but one of the drivers is the black market trade in malaria drugs. Cambodia is awash with counterfeits. Scientists have also found pharmacies selling artemisinin in monotherapies and other unlicensed formulations. Another practice that can encourage resistance is treating people whose symptoms mimic malaria, but who are suffering from other diseases. On his way to Mariope, Kojo decides to stop at a village near the Sudanese border, where a health worker has just taken delivery of a box of Lumatum, a generic ACT supplied by the government. That is a blue one. Mm -hmm. mm. What was this for? For malaria, mm -hmm. you give to a child from three years to seven years. Three to seven years. And you give two to... Two per day? Yes. Okay. In the morning, two. Then at the sunset, you give two, two. also. For how many days? This one, the, it is for three days. Okay. Yeah. And how many you ha in total you have? <laughs> It's a rare example of drugs purchased with public money getting through. You have given the drugs to... To 13 patients. Mm. But unlike at Mario Pay, there do not appear to be any paracheck facilities. Are you sure that the, all the children you are giving the drugs to have malaria? Yes. How sure are you? When I see they are vomiting, they have also fever and, and the temperature is very high. So you don't have any other possibility to check if the child has really malaria? I don't have. Yeah. How about you? So far, all the children in the village appear to be healthy. Good morning, Sunday. But the lack of diagnostic tests is a worry. In the long run, it will make the situation worse because the risk of us losing that effective drug is there. And if it happened, it will be a disaster. Kojo has noticed that companies like Coca-Cola have no problem getting their products to kick them. Neither does MTN, Uganda's largest mobile telephone operator. Private clinics are also well stocked. Dr. Vincent Ariga runs a walk-in clinic in Kitkum, offering on-the-spot tests for malaria. He says ordering drugs is not a problem. I just make my phone call and then the, my friend in Gulu, they put it in the taxi and in about four hours I get my drugs. So your supply system is it's efficient. Better, yeah, very efficient. I pick, and then I pick my money, put in his account in the bank, he gets it. Okay. So well, sometimes I may pay after a month if I don't have the money because we have already built that trust. Dr. Ariga is very familiar with the challenges of working in the public system. Before setting up in private practice, he was the district health officer for Kitko. 
Dr. Riga suggests the problem lies in the Ugandan capital. In July, a court in Kampala sentenced Annalisa Mondon and her widowed aunt, Elizabeth Nugurano, to five years each in prison. Their crime? Setting up a bogus company called Value Added Health and embezzling 11,000 pounds in grants meant for HIV and malaria. The prosecutions are part of a much wider probe into the theft of money from the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria dating back to 2005. A very good evening and welcome to this edition of the 933 KFM Hot Set. Charles Mongo Shampaki with the... The scandal is a major talking point. Charles Magani, a Ugandan journalist who has been following the story for his radio show, says the authorities need to be tougher. They don't even have the courtesy to say, we are sorry, we stole the money, let's put it back in the treasury so that it can help someone else. They just got the money and said, OK, this is money we need to eat, and they eat the money. It's uh, it's beyond description that someone can act with such a level of impunity. And they were sentenced for only five years, uh, which is a bit of a disappointment. They should have served longer. In all, investigators suspect 38 officials of siphoning off more than £1 million in global fund money. But to date, just six people have been prosecuted and only a fraction of the funds have been returned. One of the prime suspects is the former state health minister, Captain Mike Makula. But earlier this year, Uganda's director of public prosecutions announced that Makula would not be prosecuted for fraud, although he could still face charges for perjury arising out of the corruption probe. Only 25% of the drugs that are released at the national level end up in the hospitals where they're supposed to be. If the Uganda government cared that much, they would send people to jail and say no apologies to whoever has been sent to jail. If you've been caught with your hand in the till, you pay for it and pay for it heavily. However, the government sees things differently. The Minister of Health assured us that the government was addressing corruption at the national level and that the shortages were not his fault. Instead, he pointed the finger at corrupt officials in the districts. Stockouts, we are beginning to realize, are not genuine stockouts. The medicines we have in the country should be enough. Well, what's actually, are you saying that people are stealing these drugs from the hospitals, from the warehouse? Yes. The drugs are transported from what we call the national medical stores in lorries to districts and regional referral hospitals. We discovered that in some cases, these drugs were not delivered. They are selling those drugs to the South Sudan. The National Medical Store delivered drugs to districts every month. Districts receive drugs every month, but they are stolen. Dr. Malinga has now set up a dedicated hotline in the hope of encouraging Ugandans to report the thefts. I will tell them this, look, the, your government is buying enough drugs for you. Your children, your wives and the men have enough drugs in the country to cover all your illness, especially malaria. But there are people who are stealing your drugs and they are selling them back to you. They are your drugs, you should be getting them free, but there are thieves who are taking them away from you. Either they are selling them in neighboring countries or they are selling them back to you. And when they sell them back to you, sometimes they don't give you a full dose to cure you. And as a result, you remain sick, and because you have taken little medicine, which is not effective, in killing the disease, then you develop resistance. He also had stern words for the thieves. They are killers, they are murderers. They are responsible for the death of a lot of children and mothers in this country. Killing somebody is uh, a terrible crime. This is William Street in downtown Kampala, an area known as Pharmacy Village. At first glance, it looks like any other busy pharmacy district. 
but it's also home to a thriving black market. David Nahamia, a senior inspector with Uganda's National Drug Authority, is an expert on the gangs behind the illicit trade. They are very well organized. They don't sell over the counter, but they're in some strategic places where they know that people maybe are, go, are coming to buy from like a pharmacy. And they're in places which are, are very known by their customers. So they, they will come and they will not sell anybody to anybody. They will first, if they suspect, they will not sell to you. And, but if they are comfortable with you, they will say, give me the money. Give me the money, you go somewhere, get the drug. It's an organized crime. Last year, in a joint operation with Interpol, Ugandan police infiltrated the gangs by posing as undercover buyers and seized several packs of duo Cotexin, an ACT that had been donated to Tanzania. The drugs had been sitting in the warehouse for too long and were past their expiry date, so someone had simply removed the date from the foil strip. Inspector Nahamia also arrested two men for selling coartum stolen from the public sector. We knew it because that specific pack is specifically procured by government through the National Medical Stores. It's not supposed to be in the private sector. The private, private sector has a different pack. And um, when we trace it backward, of course, we found that maybe it was good from some health centers. Although the culprits were not able to reveal where they got it from, they decided to decide that they would rather get conviction. You see, they are, they are diehards. They don't want to reveal where they got it from. Because they know, of course, our penalties are not very harsh. You will just be scot free. With the help of Interpol, Inspector Nahamia is now planning a new round of raids. These police borders. We cannot, uh, I, I don't know, it's a challenge for us. The movement of these commodities. So, provided there's demand and the market, these commodities will always move. The problem is that on the open market, a pack of publicly donated kawata can fetch up to 20,000 Ugandan shillings, about six pounds. To make it harder to sell kawata meant for the public sector, the manufacturer Novartis is now stamping the pills, property of the government of Uganda. But Inspector Nahamia says the ultimate responsibility lies with the consumer. We also want the users, the public, to watch out. To watch out. They shouldn't buy that drug which is for the government. That's free, that's for them, free of charge. Uganda is not the only country with a problem. These ACTs were purchased by Kenya using donor money from the Global Fund. The pills were stamped, Government of Kenya, not for sale. But earlier this year, they were found at a drug shop in eastern Uganda. Africa also has a growing problem with counterfeit medications. In July, this packet of fake coartum was found on sale at several pharmacies in Ghana. The packaging is nearly identical. The giveaway is that the real product comes in strips of six, not eight. Similar counterfeits have also been found in Cameroon. When the pills were analyzed, chemists were shocked to discover that they contain no active ingredients whatsoever. I think producing counterfeit anti-malarials is premeditated murder. This is a disease that uh, kills and you are fooling poor, often uneducated, vulnerable people. Uh, you're, it's often the children who die and to make uh, uh, a medicine or a non-medicine and fool these people who think they're going to save the life of their, their child or their husband or wife with the tablets that they, they're buying. And to fool them in that, in that respect, I think is premeditated murder. But what if there was a simple solution to the drug supply problem? What if Africans were able to manufacture their own ACTs? That's the thinking behind Quality Chemicals, 
a subsidiary of the Indian pharmaceutical company Cepla. This is the first of its kind on the African continent. 80% of malaria cases are found in Africa, but Africa manufactures only 1% of the drugs. We had to respond to this inequality. These are mobile storage racks. When Atmithia comes in, uh, it's, it's sampled and cleared. Uh, this is where it is stored. You've got to make sure there is no chance at all of any cross-contamination whatsoever. And uh, the, the, this, is why it's, this is quite a very expensive way of, of storage, but the, these are the standards and we cannot compromise on that. Even the corridors have got what is called HEPA filters. There is no chance at all that any contamination could get into this. Uh, let's go to uh, the production area, which is the next level. So far, Sipla and the Ugandan government, which has a 50% stake in the plant, have invested 30 million in the factory. The equipment is state of the art. That's what is called the bed processor, and that's when all the raw materials are got and mixed together. From here, uh, raw materials are ready to be compressed. Uh, this is a very, very modern compression machine, and this can do up to three drugs mixed into one can be compressed into this. Yeah. We've got four of them, and in between per, per session, uh, per, per shift of eight hours, we can do up to two million tablets. That's up to six million ACTs a day. In theory, enough to supply not only Uganda, but all her neighbors too. We can supply to the entire continent. Although our focus right now is to fulfill the requirements for Uganda, and then we go to the neighboring countries within the East African community, the Great Lakes region, and then we can look at Africa. He also says the quality chemical ACTs would be easier to distribute. The drugs will get to be more quicker uh, because we shall get the raw materials on time. We shall plan our production processes on time. We shall get the products into the distribution channel, the public distribution channel on time. And then the drugs will reach the final consumer on time. However, at present, the plant is lying idle. Despite the urgent need for alternative sources of ACTs, the World Health Organization has yet to grant quality chemicals a seal of approval. Is that frustrating? It is indeed frustrating. It is indeed frustrating. This is an investment of over $30 million. You want it to be used to 100% capacity. What we are trying to work towards is to see if we can sustain the anti-malarial campaign on our own in the country. Once the factory is approved by the World Health Organization, we shall be accessing these drugs much cheaper than importing them from outside. Even the government's critics say it's a gamble worth taking. It's a beautiful idea. That factory needs to get running. It needs to produce the drugs. Personally, I don't care how much money is sunk in at the beginning. Provided at the end of the day it's able to produce the drugs that Ugandans need to be able to live an extra day. But what if there was another homegrown solution that didn't depend on the World Health Organization's seal of approval? What if, instead of manufacturing pills, there was a natural cure on people's doorsteps? I'm taking it to the nursery where I raised the Artemisia plants, which I distributed to people. Rahima Namyalo is an organic farmer and natural medicine practitioner. In 2006, she got fed up with the widespread drug shortages in Uganda and decided to try a different approach. But people were dying almost every day. But now, the moment this Artemisia got introduced in this community, People stopped dying in a how like that. The Artemisia annua plant grows very well in Uganda, 
All it needs is a rich soil, shade and plenty of water. The moment the plant starts flowering, I harvest it, I take it home, dry it, then I make powder out of it. Then I start using it as a tea. When malaria comes, I take a course, a full course of dose of seven days, five grams in one litre of boiling water. I take it for seven days. Rahima has now joined forces with a group called Action for Natural Medicine to train other herbalists. She says it's important to prepare the tea properly and to complete the course of treatment. People not finishing the dose to seven days is really very bad that it promotes resistance of malaria parasites. I train these people first. However much you feel better, make sure you finish up with that dose for seven days so that you wipe out all the malaria parasites and you get healed. Rahima argues that it makes no sense for people to pay for a pharmaceutical product when the plant is free and just as effective. The moment patients take the artemisia, even if the course, the dose, the full course is not yet complete, they come rejoicing, thank you very much, you came to help us. You know, they are like praising what they are getting. It is something they can grow, they can raise, they can treat by themselves. But can it really be that simple? Professor White points out that the leaves contain very small amounts of artemisinin, and it's difficult to extract a therapeutic dose. His fear is that uncontrolled use of the plant could encourage resistance, just as surely as counterfeit drugs. Unregulated use of the, the drug on its own, is, and not taking the right amount, not taking enough, or taking a, a, a drug which doesn't have enough of the active ingredient in it, a substandard drug, is the way that you encourage resistance. If you wanted to select resistance in a laboratory, that's what you do. There may not be much time. Alarmed by the reports of resistance to artemisinin on the Thai-Cambodia border, the World Health Organization is now flooding the region with bed nets. It's also screening people in Pai Lin for malaria and treating them with ACTs. For the moment, the containment effort appears to be working. But Pai Lin is a magnet for migrant workers, and it's very hard to stop people and parasites from crossing borders. The good news is that when the drugs do get to people in time, ACTs save lives. The kid is uh, doing better, the kid is eating. Let me sneak in, Mom. Joyce's son, Innocent, is one of the lucky ones. He got the right treatment just in time. And does the, does the child have fever? No. No, no. Good. <laughs> Thanks to MSF's prompt action, Joyce can expect her son to make a full recovery. So he's, he's doing better and maybe tomorrow go home. But MSF cannot remain in Mario Pay forever. It's important that MSF stays here. It's not an easy decision. We are here filling gaps left by government, left by other NGOs that are not committed. I went to Kigum to investigate how the drug supply from the Ministry of Health is helping people suffering from malaria to get better. But what I found is very disappointing. I found health centers without effective combination to treat malaria. I found health staff resolving to inefficient drug to treat malaria patients. I found responsible pointing figures at each other, not taking the responsibility of providing the treatment to people. On the paper, you have this wonderful capacity from the government to deliver care to the people. But at this point in time, from what I've witnessed, the government is not able to do it because somewhere people are not taking their responsibility. 
I live in New York City. I, I give patients malaria prophylaxis before they go to Angkor Wat on their honeymoon. Um, but you don't really see many active cases. In a place like this, the disease can be, can be deadly. I've seen about one kid a week die since I've been here. I don't think you ever really get used to that. Yeah. I don't think you ever really get used to that one.